to this to this idea of someone considering making a move into commercial real estate. Um, again, most of our listeners are business owners, entrepreneurs, and they a lot of them are investors. Um, but you know, a lot of them are again looking for that property. You have one right now building a, a pool facility in Northern Virginia right now for for quite a bit amount of money, and you know, but they've got a very successful. Um, business and they've had a sustainable business and just a lot of different people that are in that situation. Um, what, what, what would you, what should they be looking out for? Yeah, I think the number one bit of advice that I would give, and there obviously there are a host of factors, but I would say one thing uh, is to try to build a good team and it will go through a vetting process. It'll go through a refining process, but you need to have certain people that you trust that are experts in areas where you may not be. Um, and that that might include a real estate broker. That certainly should include an attorney and a CPA. Welcome to the show today, gang. I have the distinct honor and privilege of, of hosting and speaking with Richard Crouch, who is a partner at Woods Rogers Van Deveter Black. He is uh, the chair of the firm's business section, concentrating his law practice in business, commercial transactions, and commercial real estate matters. So he's going to add a lot of value to us today. So Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as always, we always like to kind of dig in briefly to uh to the guest background i want to tell us how you you made the uh the choice to go into law and then to focus into business and real estate what what led you down the path i knew that i always i i did uh major in finance and economics in undergrad i was a actually i was a double spider i went there for uh, university of richmond for law school as well and i knew that i wanted to do something in the business world uh, a lot of the i guess the trajectory uh, to law school was largely shaped by testing that you would take at career services, as well as talking to attorneys that I knew, some family members, not my immediate family, but but cousins of my parents and so on, to basically gauge uh, whether they had found that career uh, fulfilling. And actually, uh, one of those cousins ended up being one of my greatest mentors when I first started, um, because he, he focused in in commercial real estate. And it was kind of nice to have that resource, somebody that you were comfortable asking questions to if you weren't necessarily <laughs> comfortable uh, to your immediate supervisor. Um, but particularly, there's a lot that is not taught to you in law school. Um, law school will teach you, they have these things called lawyering skills. They'll basically teach you how to write a brief. They'll teach you how to research a case. They'll teach you generally about the law that applies in the state uh, in which you're trying to get licensed. But a lot of the um, the practical nuances and the business aspects of practicing law, you really don't learn. And actually, a lot of the technical skills outside of just drafting briefs, you don't learn until it's basically trial by fire. Um, <laughs> and you're a brand new associate and you're trying to be as useful um, to your, your immediate supervisors uh, as, as quickly as possible. And... Um, so um, when I when I first started, uh, I will say that the firm that I'm currently at is the only firm I've been at other than summer clerkships and so on, just because it's always been an excellent place uh, to work. They really do a good job of um, shaping their young attorneys and training their young attorneys, both in terms of the the technical nuances of what you need to know, what's critical in a document, but also running uh, a law a law firm like a business, and I was um, I was very blessed with the the two mentors that I had initially. One of which is probably I I honestly think he's one of the best transactional attorneys in Virginia um, in terms of his his knowledge and um, and things that he imparted to me. And then the other the other mentor I had, fantastic guy. I, I honestly it's it's interesting how he's he's become one of my one of my best friends. Um, and it was very hard on me initially, much like a coach would be on, on a valued player, but I learned a lot. And uh, I didn't like the screaming at first, but then the screaming <laughs> 
improved, but it also taught you to not necessarily make the same mistakes more than once because it was it was important. And these you know these could be real mistakes. They affect real people right. and right. real real consequences for it. Um, but he was not only good at that, but he was he was the one that basically taught me how to to manage clients, how to attract and retain clients, and and uh, how to basically not waste your client's time. Answer the question that's asked, be direct with your client, and always be business conscious um, in terms of the budget as well. Um, and so that's that's really how I ended up in the practice of law, and that's really how I ended up in commercial real estate because that was the area in which my two mentors primarily um, focused. And so that would have been that would have been right around the year 2000 into 2001. So the the upswing of the first uh, boom uh prior to the great recession uh 2008 <laughs> so it was a busy seven years in terms of my first seven years of practice um, <laughs> uh, but it was a you know even with the great recession it was a good experience and we're talking about that now too in terms of people young young folks that have only experienced a good market mm. and uh you need to experience a less favorable market right now and see how deals are still done uh with with higher interest rates and maybe not an ideal set of factors or struggling to meet certain uh financial covenants because it can't be all gravy all the time and and yes yeah, some some of the uh careers are made uh during these downtimes as well but it's it's one of those so long as you're taking a long term um approach but um but yeah so i so i'm fortunate that i not only experienced 2008 uh but now that i'm training up younger associates it's nice and and they were gangbusters busy when they first started working for me and transactional volume and it seems like almost every sphere of commercial real estate has slowed down uh right now yeah. uh, it is a teachable moment for them to say not only um do you have to get used to the cyclical fluctu fluctuations of a transactional practice um but you will start to see some clients struggle and you're going to have to pivot and probably maybe do some lease workouts, do some loan workouts and things like that until things eventually level out. Um, but it's so it's 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 good to have that now. And, and uh, I think, you know, if it happens, you know, 10, 12, 15 years again, uh, these these new young folks that we're, we're training up now will will have at least this frame of reference. Um, and it will make them, I think, better attorneys going forward. Well, no, no doubt, no doubt. So, so the mentee has really become the mentor, right? So you you were taken under the wing of of your mentors in the beginning, and 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 sort of came to came to maturity in a in a in a prosperous, crazy time. I remember that period of time, and uh, and it was it was just everything was moving so fast and. Everyone sort of knew that that you know, wondering when the chips were going to fall, but everyone was still going forward, you know, at eighty miles an hour. So, right, very um, true. But having experienced that and going through that and coming on the other side of that is great, great experience that you're passing on, and and that's super valuable for them to know because it's not always it it's not always a rosy picture. And you know, when when I talk to to people about buying commercial real estate, specifically like owner occupied, you have a, you know, you have a, a small business person, maybe it's um. Uh, success, you know, a successful HVAC company or, you know, a dentist, maybe he's been, a, he or she's been out of dental school for a few years and has got a, a successful business now and it's cash flowing and it looks like it's growing and whatnot. You know, it, it, it for, for many of them, it's an, it's an opportune time to start looking or thinking about buying their own building. But one of the things that we always talk about is it's a long-term play. It's not a short-term play. Absolutely. Because if we run into a situation like 08 and your value reverses for a while, can, can you, can you sustain through that to get on the other side of that, right? Where the where the sun will come back out and you know the birds are chirping again and, and whatnot, or is it you know is it going to take you down? So, um, talk a little bit if you would with all of your experience and what you've seen um, from a legal standpoint to this to this idea of someone considering making a move into commercial real estate. Um, again, most of our listeners are business owners, entrepreneurs, and they, a lot of them are investors. 
Um, but you know, a lot of them are again, looking for that property. You have one right now building a, a pool facility in Northern Virginia right now for, for quite a bit amount of money. And, you know, but they've got a very successful, um, business and they've had a sustainable business and just a lot of different people that are in that situation. Um, what, what, what would you, what should they be looking out for? Yeah, I think the number one bit of advice that I would give, and there obviously are a host of factors, but I would say one thing uh, is to try to build a good team and it will go through a vetting process. It'll go through a refining process, but you need to have certain people that you trust that are experts in areas where you may not be. Um, and that that might include a real estate broker. That certainly should include an attorney and a CPA, um, uh, a mortgage broker, if possible, depending on the type of financing that you're doing. But there's certain levels of expertise where if you if you find people that are very trustworthy and knowledgeable, although you may, you may still have pitfalls because everybody makes mistakes, and it's, it's, I would say it's probably better to start small so that you make smaller mistakes than to be in way over your head and unable to solve those mistakes and, and be on the precipice of bankruptcy. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, baby steps initially is probably a good plan, but surrounding yourself with good, a good team uh, is critical because, and they have, you know, they have to have not only advice that you value, but they need to be able to be candid um, with you because they're going to have your best interests at heart. And if there's a deal that you're, you've fallen in love with and um, you definitely want to do, uh, they may say, well, have you, how closely have you looked at the cash flow on this? Do the numbers really work? And, um, and I've, I, even as an attorney, I'm very comfortable with structuring deals and so on, but I have, I have done some private investment on the side and, and my real estate broker is, is very candid with me. If he doesn't think the numbers uh, quite work from a cash flow standpoint, and uh, I do listen to them, uh, even even if I have fallen in love with the property. So that's that's one thing that I would suggest. Um, I would say also don't discount the importance of papering things uh, correctly on the front end. And I, a lot of files end up being sent to us because people overlooked that. Uh, they wanted to save a few dollars. Um, and it, you know, oftentimes they don't want to incur legal fees, but it might be other, um, specialists and experts as well. They want to do it themselves. The deal might already be lean, but oftentimes, uh, they can end up in, in quite a bit of trouble. And so, um, do you have an example of that? I think one good example would be, uh, and this might be a smaller deal where you have partners and they may even be people that, you know. Uh, but there is money involved and they haven't done a very thorough job of papering how the investment is going to be documented from an accounting standpoint, what the hierarchy of distributions is going to be. If the deal doesn't work out and one of the investors wants to exit, what are the mechanisms for them getting out of the deal? Because everybody is excited at the beginning of the deal. Because nothing has gone wrong. Nothing has gone badly. Right. Yeah. And so people are very eager to hit um, fast forward on that. And so they might uh, either have no operating agreement. And by operating agreement, that's that's the document. If, if they form an LLC to basically to, to own the asset, their operating agreement is going to basically have all of the issues in terms of uh, corporate governance and how distributions are going to be handled and so on. Uh, they may not have thoroughly documented that. Um, and there are a number of other things too. If if someone's putting the deal together as the sponsor or the syndicator, um, being very transparent with everyone. If there are fees that you plan on taking, make sure that those are disclosed really from day one, mm -hmm. because you want to minimize any uh, surprises, any bad blood um, with the investors. Because at the end of the day, it all impacts your credibility, mm -hmm. and um, I oftentimes tell clients that even if you get in a sticky situation where maybe you are having issues with cash flow or you haven't paid a distribution in a long time, to communicate often with your investors and to be very transparent uh, because it will basically, it, it may save you a world of headache. Um, but some of the other things in, that I would suggest in terms of due diligence that people should never discount. And, 
Lots of times if there is financing involved, um, this will assist uh, borrowers, buyers, in actually also examining and dealing with certain issues because the lender will also want to make sure that there aren't any liens on the property that need to be discharged, um, mechanics liens or an existing mortgage or deed of trust, um, that there aren't any encroachments on your pro property or there's not an easement that maybe cuts through the middle of your building, things like that <laughs> that obviously could affect the, the value of your investment. And um, all of those third parties, you know, there's a reason that lenders require those things. Um, because the lenders, are, obviously they're lending you the money, but they're also looking at it from the perspective that they might someday actually own the asset. And so they, there is a side that where they look at it from the buyer side too, saying, okay, what would I not want to deal with if I own this asset? And so title issues, issues with survey are pretty common. Um, but I would, I would say that as well as accurately and adequately setting up the investment vehicle, the entity for this, and making sure that you maintain all the corporate for now formalities, um, not commingling funds and things like that. Because if you were ever to be sued by someone who's just a simple example, slips and falls on your property, you don't want them to ever try to allege that the entity you've set up is simply an alter ego, alter ego. Um, and basically one and the same as you, because it, it may become more easy for them to basically pierce the corporate veil and actually reach your personal assets. Um, so these are all things, it's very important to talk to an attorney about um, how to structure all of these things and what's gonna be involved. And I, I usually, when I start the relationship, particularly if the person's relatively new to doing acquisitions, I will actually send them a flow chart that actually is soup to nuts has all the various stages of the transaction from the initial contract stage through due diligence, through closing, and has basically, I would say, over 90% of the moving pieces that they could expect, even for more sophisticated loans. And that's one of those things where it's a little bit less overwhelming for them when the lenders are actually asking for these things because they're they have a better understanding of why these things are being requested. Um, and it makes things just go a, li a little bit more seamlessly and it's less um, anxiety inducing, particularly for, for people that don't have a lot of experience with, with real estate investment. Um, so those are all things, and again, I could probably go on for hours and hours about things to not overlook, but those are some of the big picture items when getting started to, yeah. to not yeah. discount, things like that. Well, I think th those, are, those are great. And one of the things I do wanna dive into a little more deeply maybe is the, cause I get this question a lot from, again, that, that that business owner that wants to buy a building, they're like, well, how should I, you know, what entity, what type of an entity, how should I structure this to buy the building? Should my operating company just buy the, this building or should I form a separate company to do this? And of course, I always send them to, to legal counsel, but I mean, and, and I'm sure there's not one specific answer every time that makes sense, but there probably are some general guidelines and some thoughts there. Yeah, I, I will say limited liability companies, um, particularly in Virginia, tend to be a, a creature of comfort. Uh, people have been using them long enough. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's been the whole time I've been practicing. They were still mm -hmm. relatively new when I started practicing. I think prior to that, a lot of people use limited partnerships and so on. Um, but their structure is very ideal because you can structure them in such a way that you have basically passed through or partnership level taxation, you're not getting taxed at the corporate level and then at the at the shareholder level. Um, the the managerial aspects are are pretty flexible. Um, that I mean you should still have company minutes and things like that. Um, but they're able to accomplish a lot of the benefits of various type of entities in one entity. Um, so that's why we tend to see LLCs more often. But um, for someone who's asking the question of, you know, should I purchase this, this property with my operating company. We generally don't recommend that um, just because it's another mechanism of basically creating silos of liability insulation. So basically you set up this one LLC, its asset is the real estate, all of the returns are handled through this asset and you're not mixing things up with your operating company. You keep those books um, entirely. Now, there are some interesting mechanisms. I won't necessarily go too far down a rabbit hole, but one very common uh, tax strategy 
is people may actually acquire a building, forming a new LLC, and it may be them alone, or maybe or, or they and their spouse. Um, but the primary tenant in that particular building will be their operating company. And um, it's really a brilliant strategy because you basically have your operating company incurring a lot of the expenses, paying random, basically ultimately paying down your mortgage for you. And there are a number of uh, beneficial tax strategies um, um, with that. But that's that's just one strategy where in terms of what do I do with my operating company versus my um, holding company for the real estate. And that's that's just one one example that you see. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Would you and you mentioned too before we hit record on the microphone that this this might this might be related this whole new the new laws that have come down around corporate transparency and is that affiliated with the, the LLC and the ownership structure and who's behind what and that sort of thing what what's going on there It exactly is it's actually it's it's federally enacted and it's the Corporate Transparency Act it actually it goes into effect officially on January 1st, 2024, which which is really right around the corner. Um, yeah. It doesn't seem to be on a lot of people's radar. And interestingly, even commercial attorneys I've talked to, not many of them seem to be too terribly focused on it. <laughs> Maybe it just, it just seems like one of those things that they know will resolve itself in time. But uh, the, the key aspects with it, um, yes, they wanna basically trace where, how things are being funded, uh, who the primary principles are. But one thing that people have enjoyed with a lot of entity formations, whether it's an LLC filing with the State Corporation Commission, a lot of the members, or we can just call them shareholders, uh, have benefited from a certain degree of anonymity by people not necessarily knowing who they are or where their money is, is basically harbored. This is going to require that there'd be a reporting for any principles. Uh, so that would be basically your key sponsors. If somebody has a real estate acquisition firm and they get investors and things like that, um, those principles will need to report their names. Any shareholder or member, uh, I'll just use that nomenclature interchangeably, that holds over 25% of the underlying ownership of interest of the entity is gonna have to be publicly uh, reported or, or entered into this database. And um, as well as anybody who's helped form the companies, which would be people like me. Um, so we actually have quite an undertaking. Um, I mean, our our firm alone probably has over 2,000 entities that we're going to basically have to be, do these reportings for. Wow. And um, you basically, um, there is a central database where you have to enter all this information. Uh, one other thing that's worth mentioning is if your entity is formed after January 1st, 2024, you do have an entire year to basically satisfy all, satisfy all the compliance issues with that. Um, excuse me, I said that incorrectly. If your entity is pre-existing before January 1st, 2024, you will have a full year, basically till January 1st, 2025 to actually gotcha. comply. If your entity is formed after January 1st, 2024, you only have 30 days after that time right. So it is, um, it's one of those things where, and there are penalties associated with that, um, uh, monetary penalties and uh, misdeme misdemeanors if you don't uh, comply with that. There are defenses to that, of course, but it is something that people should take seriously. And um, again, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, closer than it appears uh, to a lot of people in terms of the reporting requirement. Well. So just it's just another nail in the idea that privacy is dead in America. <laughs> right. Exactly. right. I mean, you can run, but you can't hide. And uh, the days of living off the grid might be, um, you know, in days of yesteryear. But uh, very true. But I guess you know, at the end of the day, that that if you're you're upright and you're doing anything correctly, you have nothing to hide, right? <laughs> nothing right. to worry right. about. <laughs> and if you work with a good attorney like Richard, he'll make sure you keep you straight. So. Uh, <laughs> and, certainly, and certainly organized. And that's a key part of it, too. I mean, that's I think that's yeah. a lot of the value that we add is making sure they don't miss annual registrations and things like that as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you're running a business or you, you have a real estate business and you've, you're buying investments and things like that, you're focused on your number one thing. You're not focused on all the compliance pieces and all the administrative things that have to happen. But, but we both know it has to happen or the machine breaks down at some point. And, um, and it becomes very problematic at that point. Um, 
So a lot of really good takeaways. This is this this is great. I, I do have a an off topic question though because I know that um, that you're involved with uh, Team Hoyt, and I would like to get. I always like to find out, you know, how how successful people are making a you know making an impact outside of just their day to day you know work. And I know you're heavily involved there. So can you talk just briefly about that and what it's all about and how you're involved? Yeah, happy to. Um, I thought I was a um... A runner before I met my spouse, and uh, but I had never. I I think I had done one half marathon, um, and in the times, uh, I guess it's been about eight years now that I've known her. I've done probably over twenty-one marathons, um, and so. But really, what fueled that is very soon after she and I uh, started dating, she got me involved with the local chapter of Team Hoyt, and uh, it was started by Dick Hoyt and Rick Hoyt. Uh, son is his son had special needs and um uh, rick was uh, uh excuse me dick hoyt was an amazing athlete and wanted to be able to include his son in that and so the concept of inclusive racing where you run a race and you, you push some somebody who has uh, certain limitations um in a racing chair was started by him and it's it's spread throughout the country and so uh we actually do a lot of races in our area um and we've actually uh, most of which are in Norfolk and Virginia Beach, but we've traveled all over the state and we've even traveled to other countries um, to do inclusive racing like this. Um, if we're not pushing somebody in a chair, uh, there are other groups like Team Achilles where you're helping guide someone who's propelled on their own power. They can run, but they have certain certain restrictions. They may have very limited vision. They may have a brain injury uh, or any any other host of issues where they need assistance. And it's um, it's just been an amazing thing to be a part of um, because it's 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 great enough to be driven enough to want to do, I mean, even a 5K, 5K, a half marathon, a full marathon, uh, but it um, it does add a layer of meaning and depth to be able to do this for someone else um, to give them a positive experience and, and in some cases to help them reach a goal, um, particularly with with groups like Team Achilles. Want to finish a marathon, uh, but they may want to finish it in a certain time, and basically being their team member. And um, it is phenomenal because um, not only do you connect with them during the process of the race, but you um, you really develop a relationship with these people that that continues to last, and it and it doesn't end when you cross the finish line. Um, you, you have you you have a relationship with that deepens with them. You do other races with them. You travel to other countries sometimes to see them, um, and so we've been blessed, and we've we've gotten to go to Athens and Greece and to do the authentic marathon twice, and um, pushing racing chairs. And the first time we actually went there, uh, which I want to say was 2018, there were some people. And it's kind of sad because in certain countries, uh, people with special needs tend to be shunned more often. Um, mm -hmm. That's not universally true, but it is true in some cases. Um, and um, but it was when we got there, they were just pushing them in full marathons in, in rickety old wheelchairs. They weren't these sleek uh, mm -hmm. racing char chairs that we have. And uh, when they saw that, um, they did a lot of fundraising. And when we came back two years later, they had about 10 of these racing chairs. Oh, um, nice. They're pushing with everybody. And of course, we've gotten very connected um, with the group in Athens. And we've we've done the same in in Belgium and um and uh, it's just been a tremendous, tremendous experience. And um, and it's it's been great being connected to the special needs community and, and getting to know the families um, like we have. So um, yeah. it's it's yeah. almost rare that we don't have a weekend that we're doing that. And uh, it almost seems strange when we're not doing it. Um, so no, it's, it's been a true, true joy. And um, some people say, well, I, you know, it's great that you give back that way, but it's it's honestly something that is so rewarding and fulfilling. I don't really even think of it that way. It's um, it's that just enriching and enjoyable that I mean I feel like I'm I'm privileged just to be a part of something like that. Wow. Um, so I appreciate you asking about it, but it's yeah, it's just a fantastic thing that I'd, I'd recommend to, to anybody who has a desire to, to run and to uh, <laughs> and to uh, run, run alongside uh, some, some just excellent people. I've seen I've seen you guys in action in various races, and I've seen the just the sheer joy in the children that are in these these racing um, chairs that you guys push, and it's just I mean it's it's it gives you 
goosebumps just just to see you know their their experience and reaction to being part of this event and to have somebody care about them and it yeah it's true truly moving so and for those that have never seen it you should at least attend a local 5k or a 10k or half marathon and see generally they start at the front of the of the race and they get a little head start and um not that they need it because they're generally very good runners but <laughs> they're, they're off the cobwebs of the court is what they say and they give yeah a yeah well richard this has been fantastic so tell tell us how if uh we have a, 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 a someone out there who's looking to buy uh commercial property or maybe they just need a, a business a great business attorney that can help them navigate growth or what they're trying to do how can they get in contact with you okay so our um, firm website is is pretty comprehensive. Uh, all of our contact information is there. Um, of course, my email address is richard.crouch at wrvblaw.com. And um, I'll give you my phone number too, uh, just my direct dial so you have it, but 757-446-8684. And um, I will say there's really nothing in terms of commercial real estate that we don't handle. Uh, even down to things like land use and tax credit deals. Um, we have 130 attorneys, so it's nice to be able to seamlessly handle all of that in-house. So i um, happy to work with people at all levels of experience. Um, and there's, there's really not much you're going to encounter that we haven't had experience with. So I'm very happy to, to assist people and, and help them particularly uh, get started. Fantastic. Well, we'll get we'll get all that in the show notes too, so it's clickable and easy to track. All those, uh, all that 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 letter, the website and everything. So anyway, uh, Richard, this has been great. I I really appreciate your time today and your insight and experience and uh, and the value that you bring into uh, to our listeners. Absolutely, absolutely, and thank you again for having me be a part of it. Hey, gang, just winding down here today. Thanks for listening to the show. And as always, if you need capital to grow your business, you're looking to, to purchase uh, commercial real estate or, or build build a building or invest in commercial real estate, or you're looking to, to acquire a business or, or a competitor or just need growth capital, we'd love to talk to you. We fund businesses all day long. Our mission is to help entrepreneurs win and to fund their businesses and fund their dreams so that they can make an impact in their community. Reach out to me today. Go to our website, click the button to schedule a 20-minute conversation, discovery call. We'll have a quick conversation, see if there's a need, see if there's a fit, and uh, we can take it from there. The website is VPC, Victor Paul Charlie dot capital. That's VPC dot capital. All right. There's no dot com on that. It's vpc.capital. As always, keep crushing it and hope to see you soon around here. Take care.